I do need to thank <coughs> the panelists and the speakers and, uh, and uh, workshop organisers and so forth uh, for the fantastic job that they've done. And um, they are um, uh, pictured here. Uh, you can see all their cheery, smiling faces. But really, this conference only works because there's about 50 people who put a lot of time into uh, putting these contributions together. Um, uh, we've also, I'm going to say, got a fantastic turnout. It's about 70% women, uh, which I think is, is good news, uh, given all the, the conversations that are going on. And um, so I just really want to take a, th a moment to thank all those people who've uh, really contributed to make this work extremely well. I also want to thank the um, advisory board. So this is uh, my advisory board, uh, most of whom are here today, but they've made a tremendous contribution in terms of putting the programme together. So if you think this is a good <coughs> programme, that's not down to me, that's down to the advisory board uh, sifting through proposals and also coming up with new suggestions for people we should approach. So they've also done a fantastic job, so I really wanted to take a, a moment to, uh, to thank them. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I hope, is hand over to um, the panel discussion. Um, and I'm really going to say nothing about that at all because I'm sure Danny's going to introduce it. And I'm going to go off the stage and leave it to Danny. Thank you, Mark. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, management of scholarly communication within institutions. And um, I'd just like to say that one of the things I find good about this conference is that it gets different stakeholders together into the same room. And um, we have to rub shoulders with each other because Mark forces us to in, in workshops and so we can't ignore each other and just speak, you know, stick to our enclaves. And that's helpful because often there's a lack of understanding about what life's like on the other side of the fence in this game. And so a couple of years ago, at the first uh, researcher to read a conference, um, I spoke here, uh, my talk was um, about getting an octopus in a string bag. And what it was about was trying to talk about how difficult it is to get information out there to the research community when you're in the kind of role that I'm in. Um, so I have live tweeted the links to, I didn't realise there was a video of it, there is one apparently, um, a video and the slides which will go out over the Twitter feed shortly, if you're vaguely interested. But the, um, while I didn't feel that I was saying anything particularly groundbreaking at that talk, I did get a huge amount of feedback from people who are outside the higher education sector because for them they found it really insightful and, and revealing about what it's actually like on the ground. So I'm hoping that today's conversation will be similar in that way, in that it is an insight for people who are not in research institutions on how things work. Because often it's the big boys like the one I work for that get, get all the sort of um, attention and that's not that's not the whole story. So it's really important to, um, to, to have the voice that we've got today. So what we've got is three panellists who are going to introduce themselves now. Um, I'm Gareth Cole. I'm the Research Data Manager based at the University of Loughborough. And I'm, for purposes of today's panel, it's important to say I'm based within the University Library. Um, because you'll see we're all based in different areas, hence the, the type of thing. So my job title, so Research Data Manager, I'm responsible really for managing the university's data repository. I'm beginning to lead on digital preservation, uh, hence my question earlier, um, across the institution, um, as well as helping and advising um, colleagues in the research office and also in the library around open access, research visibility, ORCID, persistent identifiers, um, et cetera, et cetera. A little bit of background about LACRA, um, as you can see up on the screen. Um, for those who aren't, uh, UK based, REF is the, the big research excellence uh, evaluation exercise really that's done every five or six years in the UK. Um, and in REF 2014, uh, Loughborough University, you see they submitted to 18 units of assessment and we submitted 645.64 full time equivalent staff. Fortunately, I don't know who the 0.64 person is, uh, but hopefully it wasn't too painful. Um, and that's me, and you'll hear a bit more about how we work um, over the course of the next hour. <coughs> Gareth explained a little bit about the ref, so you can see the Kent picture there. Um, I'm Sarah Slow. I'm the head of the Office for Scholarly Communication, uh, which is a brand new office. Um, my background is in research support. I worked within the law school at Kent for 12 years. Um, and we have formed this new office at Kent that works jointly with the library and with research services. So I have a dual line management structure, um, which I think we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but the office was formed because we noticed that different areas of research were being supported in different ways. There were gaps in the research support, there were overlaps in the research support. Um, so the office 
really has an overview. Um, so linking up. Uh, kind of system set up. Slido is a, a way you can ask online questions you want the, the group to answer. So if you go to slido.com and put in the event code V for victory 454, you'll, it'll come up. We're just about to put it up on the screen so you'll be able to see on screen what the questions are as we go through. We'll also be able to um, have the have questions from the floor as well, so you just need to sort of wave to indicate so that I can say, yes, can the microphone go across? We do need the microphone because this is being recorded, so if, you're, if you speak without the microphone working, it's not going to be recorded in, on the video. So if uh, the tech people, that'd be great if you could just move that across. I just thought that the, the first, there's a couple of questions in here which are quite similar, I'm going to jump them together. Um, and one of them related to, um, if I my computer would work, oh, well, let's have a restart. So I think the first sort of question relates to decision making. And so the first question for those of you who can't see, if, you, if it's not big enough, is how much does the research office interact with decision makers in the university? So perhaps you might want to talk about how decisions are made in this area in your institution, that might be a way of answering that. Okay, I get through first. Um, so at Kent there's different levels of decisions. We have decisions that are kind of top level university strategy decisions. Um, so recently we've been looking at responsible metrics, that has to, um, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment has to be signed by the, Pro the Deputy Vice-Chancellor. That's his level of decision. Day-to-day -day decisions about whether um, something should go through our Ref Assisted Deposit Service, which is where it will be entered onto our repository for you, or whether you enter onto your repository are made by individual researchers. And there's a whole scale in between that. Um, so there are people in the library who are dealing with scholarly communication, which is the chair. I, I think it depends. <laughs> It depends who, it's one of my usual it depends answers when researchers ask lots of questions, but it depends who you're talking to, what level the research is at. To an extent, it also depends, I think, what discipline um, the researcher identifies with. Um, so those in I know, physics, maths, high, high energy science, for example, something like archive has been around, what, 20, 30 plus years now. So the concepts of, say, for example, preprints, having the research, out there before it's out there, so at, um, available before it's officially published, is more common in those, some disciplines than it is in, say, humanities disciplines, where the concept of a preprint doesn't really mean, well, a published preprint anyway, doesn't really mean anything to 90, 95% um, of researchers. Um, and I think it's important when we're talking to the research community, either at general training sessions that we do or, or bespoke one-to-ones or one-to-groups that we do with various research groups and research departments that we're aware of who we're talking to as to what messages, what type of message we give across, um, what language we, and it goes back to language, it's one of my bugbears, but it goes back to, to la what language we use. Um, I mean, it, sorry, those of you who weren't in workshop D, uh, C this morning, um, but it was mentioned that, I think, I think it may have been Kirsty, that humanities researchers don't necessarily understand the word what, data or appreciate the word data in the same way, I speak as, again as a historian, in the same way that, say, a high energy physicist or an astrophysicist would not see the word data. They, they mean different things to different research disciplines. Um, so I think taking the language of humanities to the language of physics doesn't work, and taking the language of physics to the language of humanities doesn't work either. Um, so I think in that respect, we're beginning to see some resistance and but we also begin, rather than resistance, there's a, how does it affect me or what are the advantages or disadvantages of doing X, Y, Z for me? And I think the, the resistance is kind of a, a known of how this will affect me in my research. I don't want to speak, I know there's a few researchers in the, in the room, but so I don't want, don't, want, don't want to speak for the researchers when I say this, but I, I think it's a, I don't want to penalise my, harm my career, I don't want to do something that my peers aren't doing or, or aren't, um, or that my discipline area isn't doing. So I think if we can start to begin to answer those questions, then resistance may, I'm not sure resistance is the right word, it's, I can't think what the right word is, but I think resistance is almost, it's, it's got that, 
I don't know, wrong term to it. I don't think it's resistance. Uh, there's apathy. Um, there's, we've always done it this way. Why should we change? Which I think is different to resistance. Um, I think if there was, if open data, for example, was in the ref, researchers would do it. Open access is in the ref, researchers do it. So it's not that there's no resistance, it's that there's no, I don't know, there's, there's, researchers can't always see the advantages of doing what we're asking them to do, I think is possibly the best way to phrase it. And that's the role of myself and other people on the panel, other people in the audience, to get that message across in a way that makes sense and is uh, understandable to researchers rather than thou shalt do this because somebody at the centre is telling you to do this. That message doesn't work. So have you, either of you had uh, different experiences to that? <coughs> yeah, something to add actually is that when we talk about researchers we tend to talk about them as researchers but actually they are individuals. Researchers are people. They have individual research areas, they have individual career stages, they have individual skills. Um, and scholarly communication is such a big field and the ideas and activities that are available, it kind of comes back to the quote earlier about everybody thought they were more willing to change than everybody else. Actually, they may well be. It may be that this researcher here is um, fully on board with research data, is doing everything absolutely brilliantly, making it as much available as possible up to all the required standards, um, but at the same time have absolutely no interest in publishing beyond the seven or eight people in their network. Does that make them more resistant or less resistant? It just means they're engaging with the appropriate part of scholarly communications for their research. Just like someone who is writing a policy brief um, or someone who is writing lay summaries or someone who is going out and working with students, they're still communicating their research. And there's so many developments and so many systems and so many new technologies that are available that it's not possible for researchers to engage in all of them. Um, and so, since we've had the OSC, one of the things that we've been looking at is that the sheer number of systems where researchers come to conferences, they see something and go, oh, that looks exciting, and they'll look at it and they'll create a login, but then they won't fully engage with the system because the, this is a new thing, they've looked at it for 10 minutes, and then they go off in the next conference, they look at something else for 10 minutes. Um, so we get to kind of look at these new systems, new technologies, and say, what is the benefit of this? Why would you use the system? What would you get out of it? What do you have to put in to get what you need from it? Um, to be able to say to researchers, look, if this is what you want to achieve, there's four or five ways of doing it, which is best for you for the time you have available. Because researchers are not generally, I, I don't know about the other two, but in our institution, they're teaching, they're doing administration, they have academic advisees. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on their time. And here am I coming along and saying, oh, look, there's something more that you can do on top of all the stuff you're already doing. What they want to know is how to get the most <laughs> dissemination um, from the time that they have available to give to it. Um, and if it's going to take them three hours to learn a new system, they're not going to put that time in. So making it as easy as possible for them to do. So things like we have a ref assisted deposit, so um, for conference papers and articles that are eligible for the ref, it's very easy, very straightforward for them to submit and so comply with the open access rules for the ref. Um, and I think if there's something in particular that we want researchers to do, it's the duty is on us to make it easy for them to engage with because there are so many pressures and so many things that they need to achieve. So both of you have talked about um, the, uh, that people will do this because they have to do it and, the, and it's, they will do it more, more willingly if it is easy to do. Um, but do you, have you had any sort of a sense of what people's feelings are about that, just the concept of, of what they're being asked to do? Yeah, I think the resistance isn't to the ideas of scholarly communication, it's to the sheer volume of stuff they have to do. And so the um, rest of the question, I forgot. Well, it, 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 <laughs> I mean, is there a philosophical disagreement with, with what they're being asked to do, or is it just, a, just a, pr a practical one of time? I think, honestly, it is more to do with time. Right. I don't think there is any, anything against wanting to share their research or to promote it or to take the time to engage with the other people in their um, community, even if it is just, you know, five or six people that do the same work. I don't think that is in any way the problem. The only thing that I've come across is the fear of being scooped 
that was mentioned this morning, um, which does create a little bit of resistance to open access and open data especially. But even then, not really. I think most of it is to do with, yes, when have I got time to do all of that? <laughs> Yeah, the open data <coughs> question is an interesting one. Um, we don't use the term anymore. We talk more about research data management. My, my colleague, who is um, uh, has very um, colourful of phrase, said, when we first went out and spoke to, uh, spoke to our research community about open data, they were throwing the rotten vegetables at us. <laughs> and, and it was sort of true. Uh, and so we stopped talking about open data and started talking about research data management instead, which people are much happier with. Um, okay, so this now starts to get into um, more uh, other types of outputs. There's two questions that are kind of related. Um, one is how much are your research is encouraged or rewarded for making outputs other than publications openly available, like data or protocols? And then the, another question, which is sort of related, which talks about, um, now I can't find it because I think it's moved up the cage. Uh, what are you doing to understand trends in uh, particularly ongoing postgraduate research, uh, like pre-publication and so on in your institutions or across institutions? Is this something you're sort of tracking? It's certainly on the, the data side with the, um, the PGR, so postgraduate research work is something that I would like to do more on. Um, again, as, as with academics, there's only 24 hours in the day and there's only, only so much we can do um, in the time. I think it's, it's important. One thing I've begun to get involved with at Loughborough is um, begun to talking to our CDT managers and people who manage the sorry, centres for doctoral training. Um, so groups of PhD students come together in one research area and they're all under one centre, um, usually funded by the same um, organisation, be that EPSRC, um, NERC, ESRC, um, etc. in the UK. And I think talking to, just getting a more awareness of what's going on um, in the centres and going to, I don't have enough time to go to as many as I would like, but going to departmental research seminars. Um, most departments give, uh, whether it be a Friday afternoon, once a month on a, a Wednesday or whatever it may be, most departments have a, a departmental seminar series um, for postgraduates or for in, internal internal speakers, sometimes external speakers as well. And it's, it's been really useful, those that I've been able to know about and those that I've been able to get to, to actually see the research, I suppose, out in the wild. So not just as a spreadsheet, not just as a, a publication, but as actually something that is evolving, something, again, that evolving was talked about this morning, something that is going on all the time, so you know what's going on. What? Well, you don't understand all of it, obviously, but you have a, more of an idea of what's going on within departments, what's going on within disciplines, um, without, within your institution at least. Um, and I think talking to postgraduates can help with, can, can certainly and, help and with that And are they talking process. about things like preprints and so on? Are they talking about other ways of getting their research out there that, other than publishing? They're, other than traditional publishing, they're, they're certainly beginning to. Uh, I, I think it's a, a patchy story, and again, it goes back to it depends which discipline you're you're, you're talking to or which discipline area you're in, but I think there is, there is movement, there is different areas, it, it's what, and what Sarah and Kirsty were saying, there's, there's so many different things that researchers can engage with now. I think they almost want a list of, and again, it's anecdotal, but we've, I've certainly spoken to a few researchers at Loughborough, it's, right, there's 15 different research profile sites I can sign up to now. Give me the top five. Like, which ones should I use? Should I use Google Scholar? Should I use ResearchGate? Should I use ORCIDs? I know it's slightly different, but should I use Academia.edu? Should I use Humanities Commons in, in Humanities, etc.? So I think it's, there's, there's a confusion because of the proliferation of systems, proliferation of tools now. I think there's an understanding those tools and systems exist. How they should be used, I think, is still evolving. What about your experience? On the expectations and rewards, well, I think the sort of idea about, you know, one, is your, is your institution tracking this or not? And secondly, are, are you aware of um, your researchers being interested in and engaging with other ways of publishing beyond just the academic paper? So before the Office of Scholarly Communication was born, we weren't really 
Um, one of the more exciting parts of my job is to be going around and finding actually what we're doing that hasn't traditionally been put into our academic repository. So I found that we've got researchers that are doing things with Lego, with FIMO, that are making board games that they're playing at Glastonbury, and they're just not telling people because traditionally no one's cared. Um, they, they, when I say that I'm interested in them, they say, well, that's just a side to a main project. Like, it's not interesting, really. Um, but actually, that's quite key for our user engagement. We have a lot of people who are playing the board games. We have a lot of people who are involved in the participatory-based research. Um, we have a lot of policy briefs that actually have gone further than they originally were, the original audience because people have read them and said, oh, this was interesting because you might like a copy. Um, so they're very much encouraged. Uh, there is no reward system for non-academic outputs at the moment. Um, in terms of the postgraduates, actually, I think they engage very much with this um, at Kent because this is the academic environment that they are coming into. Um, and they take open, open access to research outputs um, and open scholarship more generally as a massive advantage to them. They, there's a whole load of things that are available to them um, because it's available openly that wouldn't have been available to them 10 years ago um, because the library doesn't subscribe to them. They'd have to contact the researcher and ask for it. Well, now it's available. They can just get hold of it. Um, and there's a degree of collegiality in that actually we think open scholarship is a good thing to do and we benefit from it as well. And I think as we carry on that way, um, getting our researchers to see what they benefit from it as much as what they contribute to it um, is a real asset. So you, th those two things are though, happening sort of in parallel, aren't they? You've got stuff that's being published informally and then this other work that you're now starting to uncover and make available, but that's not kind of being tracked necessarily formally. It's not being rewarded formally. People are doing it because they think it's a good idea. Yeah, well, that's the conversation we have. Yeah, ask the same question in two years' yeah. time. <laughs> yeah, ask me again in three years' time. We'll see where we're at. And um, what about you, while you have, have a cough? While I'm coughing. Um, you need to take your hand off it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I think, um, again, because, because of the, the smaller amount of research, there isn't a lot going on at Greenwich that's alternative. Saying that, we were looking at Jove... There's a joint paper between Kent and Greenwich that we were looking at Jove, which is the Journal of Visual Education, is it? Um, so it is starting to happen, but um, only in a small way so far. Uh, I haven't been there long enough to have established the uh, depth and breadth of the interesting and strange things that are being looked at. Um, yep, yep, yep. So just to follow up on what, what Sarah was saying, something I, I should have mentioned, I know <coughs> I tend to talk a lot, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing that research data management and data publication, data sharing, um, various names for the same thing, I, I, I agree with you on open data. Go to the medics and say, everything's about open data, they, you have to wear a flak jacket. Um, but it, it is allowing non-traditional research outputs, i.e. non-textual outputs, to have increasingly um, the same... Oh, uh, impact, but also the same recognition as traditional textual-based impacts. So we have, uh, sorry, textual-based um, outputs. So we have a school of arts at Loughborough, we have a design school at Loughborough, um, where traditionally their outputs haven't fitted into the traditional model, well, it's traditional a lot, their outputs haven't fitted into the traditional model of this is what a university research output looks like. It's not a journal article, it's not a monograph, it's, it's, not, it's not even textual, it's an image, or it's a, a CAD design, or it, it's something like that. And the growth of uh, scholarly communications departments, the growth of research data management, uh, open research, has actually, whether it's, I think it's kind of coincidental, I don't think it was deliberately designed to, to make school of arts or design school outputs more accessible and, and more visible, but I think it's actually given an uh, almost an advantage now to those scholars working in that area that they wouldn't have had if the open research agenda or the open research area hadn't started to kick off. Yeah. It goes back a little bit to the keynote from this morning um, talking about research that research isn't naturally article shaped 
it is, it's a process, it's a network, how you share research is you have a chat with your colleagues, so how do you replicate that? And I thought that was really interesting this morning and it just goes to show that it's come up again, so it's definitely an important point. Yeah, a million years ago when at Australian National University we were making a policy about what you could put into the repository and so we had a, a working group with researchers across the disciplinary um, kind of areas and eventually we came up with, because we're trying to work out what is a scholarly output, we decided that only scholarly output should go into the repository, we shouldn't have rubbish in there, you know, the Vice-Chancellor was really big on this. And so then it comes down to defining what a scholarly output is. And in the end, we decided that a scholarly output is something that a scholar considers a scholarly output to be. <laughs> because we couldn't break it down any further than that. Who am I to say to somebody who's an expert in another field, that's not a scholarly output if they think it is? So yeah, they do, they, do, they range across. Yeah, um, you, you talked about postgraduate research students, but I know certainly at Loughborough, but also talking to colleagues at other universities, there's a, a a push or a, a want to almost make high quality undergraduate work, which goes back to what is a scholarly output, but high, high quality undergraduate work potentially accessible. A, there's a, this is what we do, come to Loughborough, you'll be as good as this type things. So there is a marketing element, but there's also a, certainly in the, the enterprise area or the enterprise world that some of the academics at Loughborough inhabit, they, they work with their undergraduates in, in their placements, in their year in industry or whatever it may be, and the, the undergraduates are in, in some cases are seen as members of the research, well, maybe not members of the research group, but important elements in the research that's going on. So do we discount, going back to what Daniel was saying, do we discount high quality, I won't use the word the academics use for some of the stuff that's not high quality, but um, high quality undergraduate work, is that a scholarly out, but should universities be showcasing that? And should almost the training we do around data management, the training we do around open research, whether it's open access or whatever, should that go lower than, than postgraduate level? Which I, it's probably a different panel, but it's, uh, mm. I think it's, it's relevant to some, some of the questions that have been asked. So the, the, top, the top liked question at the moment um, is one about impact. Um, so this may be a kind of structural question possibly about how things are organised at your institution, because it's asking, is the scholarly communications department responsible for measuring the impact? I know at Cambridge we actually have uh, some people who, that's their job. That they're not in with the Office of Scholarly Communication, they're with the research office, but how's it, how's it organised for you guys? Okay, so for us, no, we're not responsible for measuring in the impact. Um, there's an arguable case that the REF panel is responsible for measuring the impact, um, but we have a research excellence team with a team of people that are working on the REF. I think there's a big distinction between dissemination and impact. So yes, you have your research project and you have your impact and the support for both. What the Office for Scholarly Communication does is help bridge that gap. So you're taking the research and you're communicating it in the best way possible for your users to then take and do whatever they need to do with it. So the users are the people that affect the real world change. They're the ones who take the research and translate it into something, whether that's an industry thing or a policy thing or a charity or NGO, whatever that real world change is, the OSC is not doing that, it's not measuring that. What we're doing is enabling it because that person can't make the real world change if they haven't seen the research output. And most research users are not going into academic repositories hunting for a particular article. It's about talking to them, engaging them with the research, planning for communication. So we talk to researchers about, as part of this research project, who are your stakeholders? Why are they your stakeholders? What information do they want? How do they want it? When do they want it? What format do they want it in? Um, so there was one example where we had a researcher working with a charity, published a beautiful policy report that was in the same colour as the charity used to send out their emergency briefings, so they couldn't use it. That's a really easy thing to fix. <laughs> And if they'd just sent a draft to the charity, they'd have said, uh-uh, can we have it in green or blue or orange or whatever? Not a problem, but because they waited until it was finished, it was done, it was an end product, that was it. It was too late, the print was done, the money was gone, <laughs> they couldn't use it. Um, and that's a, a trivial example, but actually they could have effected more real-world change if they'd printed it in the right colour. Um, but there's more fundamental issues in there. The people that are going to engage with your research 
are, are going to be more keen to see the results and to do something with that if they've been engaged in the process of creating it, whether that's um, kind of as things go on, simple things like newsletters, mailing lists, that kind of thing, through to being on an advisory board for a project. It depends who your research user is and how it is and <laughs> what's the best way of communicating to them. So, um, strictly speaking, uh, Greenwich doesn't have a scholarly communications department. I'm sort of it as the research outputs manager. Um, but uh, as uh, Sarah was saying, we, um, a big part of my goal is to enable everything, to enable impact, to enable compliance, um, which is the important part. Um, there is an, uh, a, a, someone who is specifically involved in helping with the communications and the impact specifically in that sort of ref space. Um, but again, Scholarly Communications Department, aka me, it's all about in encouraging and enabling. I think uh, at Loughborough it kind of depends what you mean by measuring impact um, and whether we're talking academic impact, societal impact or, or ref or impacts as, as defined by the ref. Um, for Academic impact, so uh, I suppose metrics, um, for bibliometrics, for want of a better phrase, um, that's done led by uh, research office staff with input from the academic librarians um, at, at Loughborough. So that's not actually data manager or repository managers, that's research office and, and academic librarians. It's, it's different, different people involved in that as well. For societal impact, that is again, depends which discipline it's in, but some of them at Loughborough um, have impact teams based within the schools. So our, our top level academic unit is called a school, um, based within the school, and in some cases it's, it's done at the centre. Um, so again, it's a, a hybrid, very much a hybrid model, I, I would imagine. Uh, yeah. So when I was growing up our, um, in Australia, there's a TV show called Countdown, and it has the sort of the top music, you know, it's the sort of music show. And if something went through the charts quickly, they'd say, you know, number 10, with a bullet. Um, and there was a question that's gone up to 11 answers, with a bullet. Um, so obviously people in the room want, uh, want this question asked, which is, what could the publishers in the room, so here we go, here's your opportunity. What could the publishers in the room do to help you be successful in your role and achieve your team's priorities? One thing that pops immediately to mind is, please be consistent. Let's be realistic here. So, um, what Gareth was saying about um, about language, just anything like that would make it so much easier, especially with the push towards interdisciplinary research. Um, just tweaking the language of how things are presented just to be more consistent so that someone that is traditionally a humanities academic that is taking that first tentative step into interdisciplinary research actually knows what they're trying to do. Um, that's just the first thing that popped into my head. From the, from the data world, or the data side, I would say scrap supplementary information files. Just get rid of SI files overnight and then it's text and data in a data repository, and there's nothing in between. I was going to go with the be consistent, actually. <laughs> um, and the other thing is, if we could have book chapters with DOIs, that would be amazing. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so that was a pretty quick answer. I thought we'd be talking for ages on that one. Okay, so um, th this one, I'm, I'm not quite sure exactly what it's asking, because it's saying if you could start again with the scholarly comms processes at your institution, what would you do differently? So I'm not sure if that's talking about the way you're, you're, you, you are structured within your institution or if it's the, the policy scenario you're currently living in. Or So answer how you feel that question might be being asked. I kind of feel that I have started again. <laughs> we only launched in September, so the office is six months old um, and I think part of the problem with scholarly communication is it moves so quickly there's so many um, changes new technologies new formats new standards um, new research um, that actually it's almost not helpful to think where would we start because this is where we are and it's like we are here how do we um, adapt and change and work with researchers and train people in HR, people in the research office, people in the library, people, school-based research administrators, researchers to understand this environment. What do they need to know? 
um, and what do we need to carry on looking at. So it's not kind of helpful to look back and say, what would we change from now? We are here and we're going somewhere over there. How do we ensure we get there? I think, again, um, I'm relative, I'm in an established department, but I'm a new role in the department. So again, I wouldn't start again because most of the policies that exist have been written by me. So I'm, I'm quite happy. I've created my own environment. Um, but if I could go back sort of a couple of years and change something, I think I would be, try very hard not to lose that connection with the library because I think even if my role is in research services and not in the library, that mouthpiece and the, um, the subject experts that are there would be so much of an advantage to me right now. Um, and I know that used to be there because the repository and the staff that until I started managed the repository physically sit in the library. I have to go to the library to find them. Um, so I probably that's what I would change is I would make sure that th that link stayed put because I think it is really, really important to keep all the communication channels open that we can possibly get. Yeah, I think um, communication channels, sorry, start again. I think communication channels um, are important. From the, the data side, um, I think what I would, even though I was the first research data manager at Loughborough, so again, to an extent, I, I built up that role, became what, not quite what I wanted it to be, but I was able to pick some of the bits I liked more, um, if I can phrase it that way. Um, I think I would have tried to understand better how the institution operated. Um, I'd come from a similar role at a different university, a, a, a Russell Group University, come into Loughborough, and it took me quite a long time, A, to remember I wasn't no longer Exeter, as I actually was at Loughborough, so I had to stop saying, welcome to Exeter IT, and Exeter Library, but also to understand how different departments, how different schools worked, what the the staffing levels at, in each school, what job roles existed in each, each school, sorry, academic unit, um, or, and at the centre and the responsibilities there. And I don't think, when, if, I, if I'm being honest, when I started, I took enough time to understand how the university operated, um, which meant that some of the decisions we made early on about the data repository, and particularly around the advocacy and marketing and, and talking to researchers, we didn't necessarily, or I have to say we, I didn't necessarily use the best means of communication to the researchers because I didn't take two weeks, three weeks to actually find out how the university operated, um, to be brutally honest. Mm. I've just had my PDL, so I can say that now. Well, a lot of it is trial and error, isn't it? You know, to avoid the rotten vegetables. Um, okay, so one of the questions is asking about how you highlight good and best practice among, amongst researchers within your institution. What sort of things happen in your institution to say, this is fantastic stuff that's gone on? Um, well, th at the moment, um, not a lot, but I have a plan. Um, so I've just finished writing um, an extensive comms plan that will be ramping up over the next uh, six to 12 months that involves um, blogs and Twitter and talking to the press office and things like that. Um, the first thing that I need to do, to be honest, is find the people that are doing the good and best practice. So um, has anyone got any help with that? Um, kind of feeding out of the um, non-textual, non-digital outputs, the things that we haven't been capturing, um, we're looking at joining those researchers up together, um, but having a kind of almost expertise directory for output types. So say if a researcher is um, looking at their plan, thinking about their dissemination, pathways to impact type documents, um, and they say they want to create nice guidelines, it's one example we've got. In order to create nice guidelines, you have to have a series of hoops you have to jump through to be established as an expert and to show that your project is relevant. Um, and we have researchers across faculties that have done that. Um, so having them as a group of experts for a new researcher to come to and say, right, what can I do now to prepare for these steps to make sure that these hurdles are as small as possible when I get to them? Um, the other thing that we have heard from our researchers is actually they don't want to see best practice necessarily. So you might have your global star who appears on every media show you've ever heard of or who is tweeting 
17,000 times a day and getting loads of research engagement that way. Actually, that's scary because they look at the time they've got available or they look at their research and say, I'm never going to be able to do that. Um, so it's almost the good practice is better to share because people look at it and they say, actually, yeah, I can see how I can fit that around my project or I see how that works with what I'm currently doing. Um, and again, it's been sensitive to where this sits for researchers. So for me, it's my number one priority. This is what I do. <laughs> this is what I want. I want all of, our all of our research to be communicated brilliantly. But actually, I'm not teaching. I'm not worried about that I've got a student on my office doorstep in floods of tears. Um, and we need to be realistic that actually we want to communicate and we want to communicate well, but we need to communicate well within a limited amount of time. Yeah, and I think it's just following from, from what Christian said, I've said, it's also um, where possible having, I mean, I know Cambridge have got data champions and other universities have, have data champions, so we don't have anything as formal as that at Loughborough. But I've tried to, again, again if I just speak on, on the, the research data side, I've tried to form relationships with researchers in different departments who I know that, if needs be, are, if not happy, willing um, to give a presentation or five minutes at a training session or something like that to say, this is how I do it. And as Sarah said, this is how I do it isn't necessarily this is how you should do it. It's just this has worked for me. This has worked for researcher X, this has worked for researcher Y. Maybe researcher Z can take some ideas from Y, some ideas from X, bring them together, and that's how researcher Z works. Um, so it's, it's kind of, that, uh, I suppose it's that uh, enabling peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, communication, I suppose. It goes back to what we were talking about right at the start. It's, that it's not only communication between professional service, different professional services or even the same professional service, but also communication between academic staff, both within the same departments and also um, w between different departments in different schools um, who are working in maybe using the same methodology, even though one could be in social science and one could be in civil and building engineering. They could actually be using the same methodology for that particular research project. So it's, it's trying to bring those researchers together rather than, say, as they were saying, rather than saying, this is how you should do it. So this will be our last question because we're starting to come up towards the end of our time. So Mark, prepare to, to march towards the stage. Um, it's a question about um, the challenges of getting researchers interested in open access are pretty high. So how do we get them interested in persistent identifiers like ORCID and other metadata? Well, of course, according to Ross Mountain's metadata sells itself, but maybe you have, <laughs> maybe you have alternative views. So, about 30 seconds each, what do you think about how do we get them involved and interested? Uh, it's selling the benefits. It's also, I mean, I mean, I know metadata is there, so just use that as an example. Metadata means different things to different researchers. Um, not all researchers, uh, particularly if we go, but say, to PGR, postgraduate research students, not all researchers will know what metadata means. Um, so it's using that language, and it's, it's highlighting the benefits of whatever it is we're trying to to sell or to advocate with at that particular moment in time? That's not an answer, but... I think it comes back to the, the, the triangle that Alison had this morning with the different ways of, from policy to persuasion. Um, we mandated ORCID, so I guess that's a cheating answer. Um, have, but have, it's, have they done it? Like, have you had take-up? Yeah. Right. Um, we linked it to promotions. Yes. <laughs> um, but... The, uh, that only gets the, the fraction that are going through those. But it's also talking about making life easier for themselves. So things like when you're applying for research funding, you put in your ORCID, then you can just tick little boxes rather than having to go through and enter all the bibliographic information. And, and I think with anything, it's, it's explaining to people why the, it's worth putting the effort in now. Like, what is it that means it's worth me committing 10 minutes of my time now? When do I get that 10 minutes back? Do I get 10 minutes back? Do I get two minutes back? Do I get four hours back? What is it worth for me? So um, you're saying about mandating it for um, the uh, promotions. Um, we are doing a, a top-down thing for ORCID, especially at the moment. Um, so every year for the last couple of years, we've been doing a not really a mock ref, so an, a research assessment exercise. And this year, um, if your work is not compliant, it is not going to be entered into the, in, into the it's called the GREAT exercise, GRE assessment. Um, 
I can't remember what the T is. Um, but also, if you do not have an orchid, you are not put forward for this either. And so the plan is that this year it's a research assessment and next year it will be a full mock ref with environment statements and everything. And so that's, that's what we're doing to try and encourage people to I say encourage. So it's, it's kind of like waving a big stick, but I'm hoping it works. We'll see. Right, so doing what metadata should be doing, which is integrating yes. into systems. That's, That's what it's for. <laughs> yes, excellent. Okay, well, I think we're pretty much at the end of our time, so Mark's going to leap up the stairs onto the stage, and um, I'd like to thank you all very much for, for being very candid and, and open and honest about what's going on in your respective institutions. Thank yes, thank you very much Great. for participating. Thank you very much. Well, a thank you to the panellists for an absolutely fantastic panel. I think you'll all agree. And looking at uh, going on Twitter and Slido simultaneously, it uh, seemed to be provoking all kinds of interesting comments and questions. Um, next up is a break. You'll be thrilled to know. Uh, this is a coffee break sponsored by Digital Science, so thank you to them. Uh, and so uh, we'll break now and be back here in half an hour at uh, half past three, please. Mm -hmm.